All right, we'll get started in just a minute or so. We'll give people a chance to join in. All right, well, it looks like our waiting room might be slowing down just a bit, so we'll go ahead and get started. So hello and welcome to the Circular Bioeconomy Systems Member Hour Series. Uh, today's talk is on anaerobic digestion and, glass and gas reclamation, and we have uh, Chris Shimp and Terry Feldman with us today. My name is Alicia Modenbach, and I'll be your host. Um, as a background, ASABE Member Hours were started in 2021 as a mechanism for our members to learn, connect, and grow. In a few minutes, we will get things rolling, but first some quick uh, session ground rules and speaker introductions. So for today's hour, a few general ground rules. Um, please keep your audio on mute during the presentation. Uh, if you have questions, you can place them in the chat during the presentation, and we'll also be opening up for verbal questions during the question and answer segment at the end. And this meeting will be recorded and available for later viewing on the ASAP website. So today we'll be hearing from Christian and Terry Feldman. Uh, Christian has a background as a mining engineer from Rawls School of Mines. Uh, working in the coal mine industry has enabled him to produce abandoned coal mine methane to sell, sell as natural gas since 2008, as well as having five uh, U.S. patents in natural gas systems. And six latest patent takes out the dirt from manure harvested in beef cattle feedlots, so the digesters will not be overcome with filling up. Our second speaker is Terry Feldman, PE and ASABE member. He has a background in agricultural engineering with Mar Stutz Incorporated since 2004. Terry's areas of expertise lie in animal production housing and manure storage and utilization, ventilation, and soils and structures. He has over 25 years of experience in livestock consulting engineering. So I'm excited, excuse me, I'm excited to spend this hour hearing about their work and please join me in welcoming Chris and Terry. Thank you, Sarah. I guess we'll begin. Um, I'm Terry Feldman, as um, Alicia mentioned, not Sarah, sorry, Sarah, Sarah helped with this too a lot. So anyway, we'll get started. Um, so this is just a brief overview. We're going to talk about the project inspiration and background, um, some of the components um, and the construction progress and, and a little, maybe even the next steps. But um, Chris, we're going to kind of tag team things here. And, and um, so, Chris, this is yours. Okay. Thanks, Terry. I'm Chris Shemp. So, <clears throat> basically, the uh, our core business is producing abandoned coal mine methane gas out of coal mines. We've been doing this for the last 15 years. And this this particular project on the uh, biogas digesters, like I say, leverages the uh, the production of our of our gas. Um, we use this uh, abandoned coal mine methane gas for power generation uh, as natural gas fuel. So that allows to keep the operating costs down. And we already had the uh, interconnect with Texas Eastern Pipeline. So that helps tremendous of having that interconnect cause to uh, get the best price out of your renewable natural gas through the RINs and LCF credits, um, we need to get that to market through pipeline. And so we also utilize the gas for CNG to power up our fleet uh, with uh, natural gas to run our trucks. That also helps with our scoring through the LCF credits. So we're located uh, near Harrisburg, Illinois. We started permitting and design in 2020, and the construction started in 21. Each digester is 900,000 gallon capacity with a 30-day retention time. We uh, gather the manure from a lot of local farms. We have eight farms within a half hour of the facility that we've contracted with to bring in the, the manure to the site. 
So um, here's a little video. Okay, let's go with the video. No picture, Terry. Uh oh, there we, there we got it. Okay. This shows one of our farms where we gather the manure in a holding tank. Start the rides. Manure's already preloaded in the holding tank. shot of one of the swine farms. Digesters that's generating the methane from the manure. shot of the facility it shows the two digesters you can see the mixers the three mixers in each digester the heating coils in the perimeter around the perimeter of the digester you see the gas processing in the center of the compressors it's basically a symmetrical system the overflow pipes there after it's digested comes down into a holding tank holding tank holds the effluent while the truck's being unloaded. Once the truck's unloaded with fresh manure, then it, the holding tank pumps it into the truck to take it back to the farm for fertilizer. This is our interconnect in Texas Eastern Pipeline. This is the measuring station. This measuring station measures, a, you know, the quality. That's the meat carrot. And this shows the right of way of the pipeline that's from Texas to New York. This allows us to get into the U.S. natural gas grid to take the RNG to market. So <clears throat> that, that um, video kind of did the overview, but um, just in case to summarize, you know, we take the manure from uh, the various farms, truck it to this site where Chris uh, uh, constructed these anaerobic digesters. And um, he's using uh, coal mine gas um, that he reclaims from his coal mines to uh, power his, his trucks. And um, there's two digesters and they generate, um, you know, biogas and it's going to be about, oh, I didn't write methane there. It's supposed to be about 60% methane. So, um, and then um, after uh, capturing the gas from the digesters, the, the biogas is uh, converted into clean um, renewable gas. Um, the the uh, RNG is compressed then um, it's uh, piped over to his internet interconnect location. Uh, really, it's some additional gas metering and, and um, um, prep there. And then um, on the manure itself, the digested manure, every time you put a truckload in, some comes out. So that's where he was talking about it goes down to those holding tanks. So. Um, Uh, the the uh, gas is captured out of the digester, a little bit more on that. And um, then there's a, I was going to let you talk about this one, Chris. Sorry, yeah. wouldn't I? So like you say, the, <laughs> the, the raw RNG is produced in the, in the, in the digester, 60% methane, 40% CO2, somewhere around 3,000 parts per million H2S. 
Um, we have a biological scrub. We'll see it in one of the slides where I have a netting to where it remains, the netting is in the, in the void area where the methane is accumulated under the liner. And we use that to, in, that area we induce a little bit of oxygen, oxygen, which creates a bacteria that creates a biological scrub on the, on the netting to remove the H2S. We also have the sulfur tree towers, but they're mainly for backup. Uh, the reason we did the netting is to reduce our cost because we could look it up to $15,000 a month on sulfur treat to uh, replace the sulfur treat to take out that H2S. And then the gas, the raw RNG is, goes five miles, pipe, it's piped from there to our facility. So we had to get our facility to build these, we had to get out of, and you can help me with this Terry, you know, we had, we had to have an offset, you know, I just couldn't build these digesters right next to our, to our, to our interconnect facility, I had to get it out of the way. So we were five miles out and that's where the site is. So the gas goes by pipeline to the, to the interconnect area. And that's where the molecular sieves located that actually takes out all the CO2. It'll take out H2S as well, but uh, it's mainly there to remove all the CO2, make the meat tariff, and then, it, and, and then put into the uh, existing interconnect. So this, so this Go ahead, Terry. I'll let you take that one. So, so this is a site. This is one of uh, one of our drawings that we helped with with Chris on. You probably can't read it all, but um, it kind of shows a network of piping. And I'll, I'll go over that um, briefly. So this is the building that you saw in the video. And we have some other pictures. And it it from here, manure is pumped up into each digester, and then with the thirty day our um, hydraulic retention time. As it's pumped in, then some flows out to these tanks by gravity down the hill. Um, and then, um, well, we'll get into some more details, but then they collect, we collect the biogas. It's going to be collected off of each digester and then run through. It's going to be compressed um, some and then run through some uh, cleaning that I'll let Chris talk about in a little while before it's. Um, co-mingled, I guess, if you will, back to, from each digester into one pipeline to uh, send the raw natural gas back to the interconnect facility where, where the molecular sieve is. So um, the, the pumping of the manure from the, from the uh, building up here actually runs up through here. And uh, Chris has got a heat exchanger. He can talk about it a little bit that we run that manure through to, to preheat a little bit before it goes into this digester. And um, then there's always an emergency flare um, in case you get some kind of fluctuations or like during startup that um, where, where you may need to flare some off as a safety thing or like if you have to um, do some maintenance on a piece of equipment. So uh, go ahead, Chris. Here's so, some construction stuff. Yeah, this, is, this, <laughs> this shows our, uh, our uh, start of the dig of the center part. Of it. It's a 70 foot diameter hole in the bottom. The actual diameter of the, of the outer rim is 110 feet, but this is a 70 foot diameter pad. It also shows onto the right to where we, before we did our clay compaction layer, we had to do a, a tile to for, with the department of agriculture so we have a a, a tile in this in the circumference that that uh uh in case it leaks and so if the manure was to get past the concrete and past the two foot com, uh clay compaction then it would it would go into this and leach into this uh uh field tile then and come out at the uh, which which comes out at a, a catch basin so hopefully that'll never happen <clears throat> it's got a monitoring location and, and that that kind yeah. of stuff so it's also to per um uh, primary purpose would be to prevent uh seasonal high water table from buoyancy on on things itself which shouldn't be much of an issue once once the digester is uh full liquid um but uh until you get to that point there's some risk so that that's why we've got to put it in there maintain that integrity of both the liner and the and the concrete as well so Here's some pictures of the earthwork and and bringing in the uh, the clay to make the compacted clay. liner. Yeah. yeah. 
constructing the slope. You can see where we're getting, we're creating. So we created a bowl design. The digester is just not a, a cylinder tank. It's a, it's a bowl design with a sloped side. The purpose of that is we wanted to put this in the ground. We wanted the, uh, the uh, uh, earth dam up around, around it in the ground, sort of like a, a concrete lined lagoon. And uh, we were doing this to try to reduce our cost. It was a huge cost savings. Uh, you can see where we uh, did our slope, where you can see the slab. And then we started doing the form wall. The, the digester walls are eight feet. Um, and then this, uh, go to the next slide. I think she was about 16 foot deep all together from the wall yes. to, the, to the base slab. Correct. Oh, yeah. And then now we can see the eight foot walls. We poured, you can see in the walls too on the upper part where we poured in piping to access the digester for the manure and also for electrical cables, uh, temperature probe, uh, uh, water for the heating coils. And see they're putting the insulation for the backfill around the perimeter of the, of the vertical wall. Mm -hmm. And you can and then, see the mixers. These are the these are there's three mixers that 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 spin the manure in a in, in a centrifugal motion. The purpose of that is the manure comes in. The fresh manure is 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 is, is lighter as the anaerobic digestion takes place. On the, uh, then the manure becomes heavier. And so as it the 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 older the manure is, the heavier it is. And so the older manure migrates to the outer rim. Where the overflow pipes at, and they're they're put on a, uh, a rail system. If you can, yeah, you can see there's yeah. they could be removed for maintenance yeah. and that kind of stuff. Correct. If you lose one, you can pull it straight up out of the digester and drop another one in. Here we go. Here's the epoxy coating. So to keep the uh, methane. <coughs> So we have a two foot, two foot void to, uh, so we, the overflow pipe, like you say, is located two feet below the top rim of the concrete. So it creates a two foot void uh, where the concrete then is exposed to the methane and H2S and the CO2, it's highly corrosive. So to keep it from reacting with the concrete, we coated the upper, the upper two foot where we went and followed three to four feet with, uh, with an epoxy coating. Yeah, for some of us ag engineers that deal with uh, manure systems, we call that the freeboard. <laughs> and then we have a, you can, see, you can see our heating coils, uh, they're steel pipe. And so the yellow, the yellow is a, uh, is a, it's an, it's a cathodic protection system. That's what you use a rectifier. And so that's the sac sacrificial anoid to keep the, uh, to keep the pipes from rusting. Uh, just, just similar to what we do to natural gas pipes that are in the ground, steel pipes that are in the ground, they do cathodic protection, protect them from corrosion. We did that instead of stainless steel pipes. So here you see our netting. It's a, it's a, a netting that <clears throat> we use to straps to help hold the netting up. And it'll, it's where the, that's the H2S netting for the biological treatment. And then I also will end up holding the uh, a cover, um, you know, once they put the cover um, the, over top of the digester also. Yeah, we will we'll wait till the manure, the, the, uh, we'll wait till the, the digester gets full of manure before we, we put the cover on because that structure cannot hold the cover. Um, we'll have to have the, the fluid level up to the, all the way up to where when it sags down that the manure level will catch the liner. It's a hundred mil liner. So it's pretty heavy. Let's see what this video looks like too. I didn't realize this slide was a video. There you go. Nice job, Daniel. Yeah. I'm not sure if Daniel's on, but. Here's the truck shed where the manure comes in. You saw in the video earlier mm -hmm. um, and office and everything as well. So this is a, is a double truck base. So you have one truck coming and yeah. uh, at the same time as another one. And then um, 
behind that white man door is where you have all your um well chris you talk you talk about yeah, that. We, pumps the pumps so we have our generator we generate all our electrical power on site uh with a natural gas generator we uh, have our macerator or pumps that pump it up to the the manure into the digesters in our frequency drive so each uh each pump has its own frequency drive it's a fully automated system there's high and low level floats in each one of the the tankers on the trucks so when the driver gets there he hooks his truck up and then when the when the tank's emptied from fresh manure then the float actually I, if through the frequency drive shuts off the pump then uh and then the uh, black tank there is full of the what comes out of the digester so the you know this is fully operate when a full operation your digester is full so if you pump in six thousand gallon you'll get almost six thousand gallon back and so that goes back to the farm that we call it the effluent and all the nutrients remain and then they're therefore the farmers want it back for uh for fertilize right and we size these black tanks then that you see to be a uh, more than six thousand gallons so it can take that whole truckload um after it uh, comes back out correct so here we see the uh, symmetrical layout of the gas gathering uh, under the carports there's two gas drivers of course they are um, uh, gas engines 59 cummins again we're we're keeping our costs down by utilizing our coal bed methane to power up the compressors the compressors then uh, take the gas off of the digester we try to keep a positive pressure under the liner uh, and so we have a murphy control system that will speed and slow down the compressor to maintain a positive a positive pressure but not allow over one pound of pressure to to over pressure the system as well and and so then the the uh, the compressors push the gas then they go through the white buildings. You can see the white little sheds. Um, they look like outhouses, but they've got our Murphy, our, uh, our metering and our chromatographs in there. We have to have that metering to measure the quality and quality of the gas to satisfy the LCF credits and the RINs. Then they go through the H, then the gas goes through their own set of H2S towers they're there until the biological scrub gets activated um, and then after that uh, they're basically for backup in case something happens with the biological scrub then the gas comes together to a central point coal mingles together and goes to the chiller and that that round cylindrical similar it's a line heater so it it's a it's a bath that's chilled to, and as the, the gas goes through a set of coils it cools the gas to drop out the water then the last vessel is the water separator that uh, jumps the water and that purpose of that is because our gas then has to travel five miles to the interconnect and the gas is saturated with water as it comes off the digester so we don't want our pipeline our five mile pipeline to fill up with with water because as you know as the gas travels through the ground it could go to 58 degrees and that will drop that would drop out of the water and we'd fill our pipeline full of water so this is the molecular sieve uh it will be completed here in the next three to four weeks but this is this is uh uh the a yield unit that removes the co2 at the interconnect So uh, the steps, the lessons learned, oh my gosh, lots of learning curve. The whole purpose of, of, of building it the way we did with the digesters in the ground was to get our capital costs down. So the first digester was lower than buying a kit, a stainless steel tank uh, with, a, with its pre-engineered. Uh, those are very expensive, but our first digester was expensive because we went through a learning curve of how we maneuvered our dirt because we had to bring our dirt back for uh, for a two foot com compacted clay liner. We, we, we tried to save distance by using a, a track hole to pile it up in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in 
circumference around us, it become an obstacle for us. So then we ended up getting a pan and moving our dirt off site away from the digester is saved on labor, almost like half the cost. We had lots of uh, supply chain issues. Uh, while as, as we went through, we'd seen we needed additional things and we had to order things that was, so now we know how to plan more ahead because like I say, we didn't buy a pre-engineered system with a kit that come in. Uh, we built this as we went and uh, there's, we ordered things well in advance and still didn't get it on time. We went through our learning with the RENs and LCF credits. That is, uh, we had to hire several companies, Eco Engineering and Weaving, Weaver Engineering to help us navigate that. And we went through a lot of learning curve on meter placements and uh, where we had to put them and, and, and what we had to monitor, even the flares. And then our CO2, uh, we're, we, we didn't think we needed an air permit because it was going to sequester our CO2 through an old oil well, no different than they put salt water uh, in the ground from oil wells, but inject it into, into formations. But to meet LCF credits, we needed a five to $10 million geological survey done to make sure it didn't leak and that was not available. So now we need an air permit. So now we're, we're going through, that's just part of our learning curve. Next time we'll be more efficient and more timely. So, yeah, quick. questions. We did all right, Chris. I was worried that we'd go really long, but. Uh, yeah, we, you kept me moving. <laughs> all right, well, thanks. Uh, we, we've got a couple of questions that are popping up in the chat. So feel free uh, as more questions come in, um, just, just uh, drop them in the chat and we'll get to them as, as we go. Uh, the first one is, this is a multi-part question. So if I need to repeat anything, let me know. Um, what is the energy balance on this system? What is the what? Uh, the energy balance on this system. <laughs> okay, the energy balance, wow. So basically it takes just as much energy that you get out of it. So I'm using abandoned coal mine methane gas right now. The, get, the market for the market is $2, less than $2. I think this morning, $1.90 per, per MMBTU. So we're taking $1.90 to $2 gas to, to, and we are creating about the same amount of volume, but through the RENs and LCF credits, LCF, LCFS credits, we're probably gonna get somewhere 90 to $100 for our gas. So we're trading $2 gas for a hundred dollar gas. Okay. Um, oh, questions are coming in faster than I can read right now. Let's see. Um, what comes from coal mine gas and manure? I'm not sure I quite understand what that one is. So if the person who wrote this question uh, wants to elaborate on that, that would be helpful. So uh, I guess we're getting confused. So we have two different uh, sources of our gas. Our core business is producing methane from abandoned coal mine methanes. That is separate from the methane produced from the swine manure. So, but we're using the, the coal mine, abandoned coal mine methane, instead of selling it into the grid, we're just gonna use that to power up our facility to produce RNG through, through swine manure. I hope that answered that question. Hopefully so. Um, what is used for heating the digester? So again, uh, I don't know if we can go back to that slide. I guess I kind of yep. went over that, Terry, too quickly. I, I forgot to. Yeah, I forgot so, to remind you. So we can see the two boilers with the stacks in the center. There are two one million BT boilers, and. Uh, we're using the, the, the again the abandoned coal mine methane gas to heat those to heat those line heaters. They're line heaters from the natural oil and natural gas industry. Uh, they're a bath uh, uh, where there's a set of coils that go through there. So the the pipe that goes through that bath is heated up with the heaters in the bottom, which circulates the hot water through the coils in the digester. The reason I have them in that location is I'm taking the jacket water off of the uh, compressors and I have a separate set of coils going there and trying to preheat the bath in that tank 
with the water jacket uh water and then the boiler acts is is basically a backup it it kicks in when the jacket water can't is not sufficient uh also we have the two outer tanks that the they're you can see they're silver they're lap, wrapped in aluminum because they're 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 insulated but those tanks are heat exchangers and they are taking uh there's a set of pipes that that the exhaust of the compressor travels through there through a four inch pipe and the manure travels through the tank as it goes into the digester from the truck so it preheats the manure before it goes into the digester and what temperatures are the operation temperature of the digesters well it's just we're mimicking stomach what we're doing we're mimicking an animal stomach and it's 98 degrees just like your stomach and that's what creates digestion all right, I see we have someone with their hand raised. I'm gonna hop over to that question first. Aaron, if you wanna unmute. Sure, thank you, Chris, for your presentation. It's cool to see my dad's green bin in the back of the, one of the pictures there. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So um, you mentioned the, uh, the fertilizer that comes off of these um, facilities after the methane is produced. That one there near, um, I call it the Lampkin ground is a uh, chicken effluent, correct? Do what? The what? That now? one there, the new one that you guys are building, that's chicken effluent, correct? On that one, or is that hog as well? It's hog. It's yeah. hog, okay. Because chicken's not, chicken's not, the pathway for chicken manure is not created, it has not been created for a pathway through the California LCFS credits. Okay. Um, could you give a little bit more detail on the, do you guys plan to sell that fertilizer that you're using from that hog effluent back to the farmers? No, so we pay we pay the farmers a one eighth royalty. I created a one eighth royalty system, just like an oil or gas well. So if you own the the, the, the minerals in, on your ground, is and you'd get a you know somebody wanted to produce the oil or gas from your property from your minerals, you get a one eighth royalty. So I treated their methane, their you know manure the same way, and so every farmer has his own little oil well, <laughs> and so I pay him a one eighth royalty off of the methane. And so he wants the he want but he, he gets a one eight for it, but he wants it back for fertilizing his own fields. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Next question in the chat. What kind of control and monitoring monitoring systems are you using? So we just we use frequency drives that basically uh, uh, have switches that operate them. It's real simple. Uh, I have a huge control panel that I'm having built uh, that monitors, it does a little bit more sophisticated, but I couldn't get it in time. And so I had to buy these individual frequency drive boxes that operate each pump and mixer individually. But we have a, uh, a temperature, basically it's very simple. We have a pump on our boilers and that pump kicks on and off based off the temperature probe inside the digester. So that does the monitoring there. We do have a computer system that gathers all the data from the, the, from the metering. And uh, we have on the trucks, we have a air scale system. Each truck has its own uh, scale system on it that uh, the truck drivers will enter, watch farm, and the amount of weight he has on each truck. And then we have a, uh, a, a unit in the pipe that measures the, uh, the flow also coming up through from the pump up to the digesters. So I had to be, I had, I had to, I had to shoot from the hip on this one because I had a very nice control room built ready for these frequency drives with a fully computerized monitoring system that I could not get in time. I may not get it for another six months to a year due to the supply chain problems. So uh, that's one of the things I had to uh, shoot from the hip on. All right, next question. Uh, can you explain again the purpose of the methane netting over the digester? Yeah, so what happens is <clears throat> if you, when the methane netting is inside the, the void area where the methane is, is, is accumulated. So as the methane comes off of the manure, it's, it's, it's accumulated under the liner in that two foot overboard area. 
and then the liner will lift. And when the, the, night, the liner lifts, it creates sort of like a bubble. And inside that bubble is the, meth, is the netting. And then we have a little airline that is, it goes into that void area that where we can in, in do, introduce oxygen. So we introduce a certain amount of oxygen that causes another bacteria to grow in that space on the netting and will consume will consume, take the H2S and consume it on the netting. The netting, the H2S will grow like little icicles on the netting and then, they, and then they will drop out and then they come and, and, and they will accumulate in the bottom of the digest. Uh, we have another hand raised. Uh, Julia, do you wanna unmute and ask your question? Um, yes, so you mentioned that Currently, it's, put, it's the amount of energy you're getting from the system. It's equivalent to what you're putting in. There's no energy gain from this system. From an environmental perspective, would that be the same in, in terms of the, uh, the carbon and greenhouse gas emissions that's producing the amount going in at the moment is, is the same as, as you're saving from having a, a more renewable type of, of natural gas? So that's a good question. Um, so what it is, is that, let me, so what we're doing, we're preventing the methane to getting in, in getting into the atmosphere. So every lagoon that's on these swine farms is as big as a football field. And what happens in the summertime when the sun heats it up, anaerobic digestion uh, happens naturally. And all this methane is all of a sudden released through the summertime in a, tremendous amount of methane just flowing out of these digesters into the out of these lagoons that are on the farm. So, you know, they flare oil and gas wells. So how I can relate this is the purpose of flaring an oil well is to destroy the methane before it gets in the atmosphere. That's been around for 50 years, maybe even longer that we have to flare oil wells. We cannot flare a lagoon. And so what I'm doing, I am gathering this, this manure before it gets into the lagoon. That was the purpose of the tank, to, is to capture it before it gets into the lagoon. And, and, and we are taking the methane, we're capturing the methane before it has a chance to get it, it's emitted in the atmosphere from the lagoon. Uh, if you was a bird and you could fly over, if you flew over that lagoon during that time, you, it would kill you, that, you'd have that much it's a tremendous amount of methane coming off those lagoons. So, so that's where I get paid. I get paid through the credit system of capturing that methane and saving the atmosphere because methane in the raw form is you know, 100 to 200 times more uh, toxic to the atmosphere than regular emissions. So they look at my, the, my credit scores based off, they look at my engines, they look at the emissions that I'm creating. That's why I run CNG tractors, natural gas tractors, instead of diesels, because I, I, I'm saving the atmosphere, say, a thousand units, but I'm creating 200 units of, of emissions. So that gets subtracted from me, and, that's, and I get back, paid off of that. So, yeah, I have to have a net gain of saving the atmosphere from emissions. So, my trucks that run off of gas instead of diesel. That's why I have heat exchangers trying to capture all the heat I can off of my engines because my engines are creating emissions. So all the emissions are added up and it's subtracted from the emissions that I am preventing. Okay. I thought that, that, is, that, that, that latter part was exactly what I was getting at because I'm, I'm very familiar with the dangers of methane. It's what my thesis is going to be on. That's why I'm here. But, um, I have a follow-up question if that's all right. Yes. So assuming that this is uh, that there isn't a net energy gain, my question in terms of long-term viability, um, if the system is only ever producing uh, what it creates in the short term, it's having a tremendous impact on the environment. Do you see a method to increase the efficiency so that um, the energy output so that we could make this a completely carbon, eventually carbon negative like process so that we're, you're actually producing more and not having to rely on other energy sources. Um, so we, we're looking at solar, uh, but it's so expensive. So this, the capital cost would really make the return on our investment too far out there. So, um, but there is, there, you know, um, 
then that's why we're using heat exchangers trying to capture all the heat. Um, but yeah, and and then and again, you know, the molecular sieve takes energy. I'm even I, I'm even including the compressors and the molecular sieve to even inject because you know the pipeline's 800 psi. That's and so we have to have a lot of uh, muscle and horsepower to get the gas into the pipeline that takes it to market. So yeah, that's that's a lot of things to overcome, uh, and solar doesn't have the muscle or the capital cost to do that would be would, would negate it economically. But uh, far as the future goes, as far as trying to reduce that footprint, um, I would say, yeah, we're always we're always coming up with better ideas. So I don't have a complete answer for how to how to reduce that much more than what we're already doing. Um, you can go all electric. Um, but again, your electrical power, what my problem was here with the LCF credits, if I went all electric, they would see that, especially in Southern Illinois, that I was uh, getting my power from coal-fired power plants. So that was, going to, that was going to hurt my score too. So that's why I decided to burn uh, natural, natural gas through generators and through engines instead of, and stay off as electric as, as much as I could because I was going to get docked quite a bit. Because Illinois, I think Wisconsin, there's a there are a few states here that the California sees is is, uh, is coal fired. And Chris, there's other models that you're considering too. You know, this model is more of a community type digester where you're commingling manure from multiple small farms to this site. Um, and your other in your other models is you know putting digesters on the farm so yes that reduces the trucking cost quite mm -hmm. a bit and but we still when you put it on the farm if you don't have a pipeline that you so what happens instead of hauling 10 loads of manure a day you can haul one load of natural gas through virtual pipeline using using cng compressed on 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 tankers and and then you can haul your haul your methane to your interconnect so the problem is yeah, we can build digesters at the hog, at the at the at the at the, at the, uh, at the farms, but then is there a pipeline nearby? So that's the golden rainbow. If you can find all that in one place, you're lucky, and everybody's going after those sites, and they're very rare now. So you're either going to have to truck the manure, or put the or put the di or truck the gas. And it's got to be pretty significant because an interconnect into a pipeline is not. Oh, it's expensive. <laughs> you know, a couple million dollars and a couple years to get done. All right. Uh, next question in the chat: What do you do with the CO two? Well, uh, right now the CO two is uh, that's part of our uh, uh, getting a dock to it's, it's emitted to the atmosphere. But if you take the raw methane and and see how how uh, detrimental it is to the atmosphere. And there's a formula for, formula for that versus your emissions in the CO2, you still have a net gain, a huge net gain of, 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 um, of less emissions in the atmosphere. So, um, but right now we are, uh, we're gonna be running it uh, through a vent, uh, through our flare at the molecular sieve it takes it all out, but we are in the process of putting in a CO2 liquid, looking at it this summer, putting a CO2 plant there that will liquefy the CO2 to food grade, and we can take that to market. Uh, since you mentioned the molecular sieve, can you please explain the molecular sieve methane recovery efficiency? How much methane content in product RNG? Well, uh, nothing's 100%, so the molecular sieve is 98% efficient, so we do lose 2% of our gas uh, through the waste stream of the molecular sieve out through the flare, and uh, that is, uh, goes out with the CO2. And then we have to add some gas to that to because uh, the concentration is so low in the flare where it won't burn. So we have to supplement that with additional fuel to get it to burn. But but then the uh, RNG is um, through the sieve that goes to the pipeline is, um, you know, nearly 100%. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, that's so, a tariff. Yeah, that's a nut. Yeah. You are allowed to put up to two and a half percent CO2 into the in with your natural to meet tariff. You can you're allowed so much CO2 and so much nitrogen. I believe it's two to two and a half percent. Uh, so you can be 98 percent methane and two percent CO2 and still meet tariff. But the molecular sieve takes it all out. It 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 gets a hundred percent of it. Um, then that's why when we're losing 2% of our gas, so that's why we're looking at a CO2 plant there. To, and so when we, when we liquefy the CO2, we'll recover that 2% loss of RNG, which is, helps justify the plant, CO2 plant. Oh, what percent of solid returning, what, what percent of the solid is returning to the farm as fertilizer? Well, I have I well, I'll, I'll know more when we get up and uh, actually get to that point. I can just right now guess. I mean, we're targeting ideal is ten percent solids in your digesters. That's your optimal amount. But we we're going to probably be around. You know, we're having a mixture of solids. We're we're actually hauling. You know, twelve uh, percent uh, of our uh, manure is going to be a dip from a dairy farm. So we're adding two truckloads two truckloads of dairy manure uh, out of the 10 truckloads that's going in there. And we're introducing the, the dairy because it gives the, 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 the cow naturally has a bacteria that we have to have for anaerobic digestion where the swine doesn't. But <clears throat> so we have a mixed bag. And so that mixture of solids may be somewhere around say 6%. Uh, from what I understand, through anaerobic digestion, you may lose you may lose one third of those solids. I don't know that for sure. Somebody else may know, may know may know more about that than me. So, from what I know, that we'll lose one third through digestion. Yeah, normally we have about eighty five percent volatile solids out of the total solids. So. Uh, we're trying to destroy as many as we can. And one of the things Chris is doing is um, he's valuing this manure. So he's doing a 30 day HRT instead of just 21 or, or less. And so he's trying to destroy more solids out of that manure and, and make it into methane. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it, it he, he's, he's going to be, his goal is to be pushing that that one third um, mark there. Do you know approximately how many hogs are supplying your manure? I'd have to count them. I'm thinking somewhere around twenty five thousand. Let's see. Um, what is the capital cost for the second system, and do you expect the cost will go down for the next digester? Well, both digesters are built, okay? So I did reduce my cost by half through my learning curve. We are under, a, uh, be, uh, we have a contract with British Petroleum on taking the off offtakes on this. And so under that contract, we have to build a project two. And yes, we think we can reduce that cost, uh, the total cost probably by, this project we did for uh, under a five million. I believe we can do the next project for like uh, four million. What H two S removal technology is used in the scrubbers downstream of biological desulfurization, and are there any issues with struvite buildup? Say it again. Can you repeat that? Sure. Uh, what H2S removal technology is used in the scrubbers downstream of biological desulfurization? Okay. So, and, and then are there any issues with struvite buildup? So uh, <laughs> what we have is we have this, the uh, two H2S towers have a, uh, have a sulfur treat in them and it's just an absorbent material. That's why we're losing you want to use the biological scrub to reduce our operation costs because we have to replace that sulfur treat in those towers. Um, my, own, my purpose is to try to take the H2S out. Now the molecular sieve will take it all out. It'll take the H2S out too and it'll go to flare. I'm just trying to prevent the H2S, trying to reduce it because of the, uh, it's harder on my equipment 
uh, and I'm taking that H2S five miles, which is still legal, uh, but uh, I'm trying to reduce it as much as I can at the site before it gets to the interconnect and travels the five miles. And that, that's, the, that's the purpose of it. So there is, there's three, three defenses there. Well, first the biological scrub, if, it, if it's not working properly or 100%, the H2S towers, then we'll take it out. If something happens then, then it'll go out through the flare, through the molecular sieve. All right, next question is, what's the radius the manure supply travels? Oh, we're all within, we're all within, uh, gee, uh, 45, 45 to 60 miles. And where did the money come from to do the project? Oh, we're self-funded at ourselves 100%. Uh, we have, uh, we have no investors. So uh, I know a lot of these projects are built with a lot of uh, speculation money. Um, so I didn't, I didn't, that's why I had to go in and try to find ways to cut my capital. I couldn't, uh, if I had went and bought one digester kit system, just the, just the kit alone would have been 4 million. This, this project was done under $5 million for, and typically a project like this would have cost 15 million. That's why uh, we try to do it ourselves. Um, next question is, is the manure pasteurized? And if not, was there any concern of biosecurity from the participating farms? <laughs> well, that's a good one. I did have that issue with some swine farmers that did come up because especially in the, in the, in the, in the, in the hog business, cause they're not like dairy. They're a little bit more sensitive to biosecurity. So that's the purpose of the tank. Some were worried about it. That's why the tank is away from the barns. Uh, we're no, I could say we're no different than a custom pumper. You know, if they, if the swine farms hire a custom pumper to pump out their lagoons, you know, those trucks come from other farms. So basically <clears throat> that's how I had to present it. And we did, we put the tanks away from the barns, closer to the lagoons to where we, that would not be an issue. And Yes, that was a concern bio biosecurity. Um, so that that helped that by building the roads, building the the, the, the tank that gathered a, away from the barns closest to the lagoons, no different than a custom pumper. I uh, gotta thank you for the nice presentation. And could you please elaborate on the REMS and LCS credit mechanisms? <laughs> okay. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail, but I'll give you a real brief overview, quick one. RENs, RENs, every refinery, this is a, they're federal. The RENs are federal. There's different levels, but we're at the highest level by using um, uh, agriculture manure. So every refinery in the United States, this is a federal mandate that produces uh, motor fuel, like gasoline or diesel fuel from oil in their portfolio, they have to have renewable RNG, they have to have renewable motor fuel. Okay, so uh, RNG is uh, that's produced uh, renewable natural gas that goes on a CNG station. So this gas is sent to an RNG uh, to a to a CNG station where it's loaded on trucks and cars for motor fuel. That's what gives us the RINs, the D3 RINs, to where we get uh, top dollar for it. So we can put our gas on any CNG station in the United States to get the RINs. So instead of picking any state, we pick California. So if we pick California and put it on a CNG station in California, not only do we get paid for the RINs, then we capture the LCF credits, the low carbon fuel standards. So California had put in their system to where uh, any, uh, uh, it's available now that any, any gas produced from dairy manure or swine manure that's, uh, and this gas is put on a CNG station in California, you are, uh, you qualify for the LCF credits, the low carbon fuel standards. Where does that money come from? Everybody that buys diesel or gasoline 
in California, there's a 22 cents tax added onto that fuel to pay people like me to do this. That's as simple as I can get right now. And it's complicated, believe me. I had to hire some engineering firms to help hold my hand and walk us through that process. I guess we didn't warn you that you were going to get some tricky questions here today. But, but anyway, look, the RENs, the RENs, what they do, they go up an auction block and the refineries buy those every three months. So, but that's why I had British Petroleum in. They took 15% of the deal to be able to place those. So basically they just write me a check every month and that's their worry. Um, this one's just a comment, but uh, especially on new CAFOs, it's a great opportunity to install manure, methane digesters, as well as solar panels on free stalls and other barns. I don't know if you have any comments for that or- Do what? So, uh, is that especially on new CAFOs, it's a great opportunity to install manure, methane digesters, as well as solar panels on free stalls and other barns. It was just a comment on, on okay. what you were talking about. Yeah. Um, next question, we have a few more questions here. Um, uh, could you use the gas you're producing on site to power your facility and trucks? Yeah, I mean, you're wasting it though. You need to put it, you got to put it in the pipeline and go to the CNG station in California. So when we put it in the grid, it goes to California through the United States natural gas pipeline grid. We got to get it in the grid and that's where you get $100 for it. You don't want to burn it on site when you do your, I mean, I could, I could buy gas from the local gas utility for six or eight bucks. I'm only, and so I, I, you're better off to buy it for six or eight dollars and, and save that, the, 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 the gas that's produced on site needs to go in the pipeline where you get your hundred bucks for it. So, uh, but instead of me buying it for six or eight, I am, I'm only getting paid when, because I, I sell it wholesale in the pipeline. So wholesale prices are $2. So I just soon use it on site instead of getting paid $2 for it and save the gas that's being produced and make sure it goes all goes into the pipeline and get the $100. And that's per MMBTU, one MCF. Um, I have heard that the mixing propellers inside some digesters were being eroded rapidly due to the silica present in the manure coming from the wheat straw used as bedding maybe. Have you seen such thing happen in your digester? Again, we're just getting started. I don't know. I hope it doesn't. From what the uh, the manufacturers, they've already dealt with that. Um, we're um, we're our swine manure. So our dairy farm so far does water beds. So um, we won't have that issue with the straw or at the swine farms. Um, and then last comment and question here as we're approaching the top of the hour. Uh, great project. I'm not familiar with the energy landscape of Illinois, but assuming as in Canada, it's based around one or a few central pipelines with minimal opportunities for input. Would the gradual implementation of more microgrid based systems alleviate some of the energy inefficiencies? Would this allow the digesters to be on the farm while still allowing them opportunities to connect to other energy consumers? Wow. Did you catch that, Terry? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, <didn't> Julia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm watching this chat here. Okay. Um, anyway. Um, Help me on that one. It, I, didn't it's, get, it's, I didn't digest all that. <laughs> It's 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 fun to get this. This is an international community, Chris. So Julie is from uh, Canada. I'm 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 guessing here. So um, I, I think there's some possibilities. You know, we're trying to do some work here to to help the environment. Um, but as you could tell from several of Chris's answers, things I think things have to pencil, and um, that's the bottom line. And we're not you know, this world isn't quite set up to, um, to make that happen yet. You know, we're, I think we're getting there, but uh, I do think part of the piece of the puzzle 
um, is the digesters on the farms that that helps the economics. So, um, so you know, I'll 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 make one comment. I mean, my whole purpose of doing this myself, I mean, was to get. I had to do it with low capital. Okay, if I didn't, and I was going to buy a kit or have a another company come in, you know, and spend 15 million on it, I had to brought in investors. But my whole purpose was this, was to do it myself, to get in it as low capital and go through my learning curve. I went through my learning curve. So I have other investors that are challenging me to take it to the next step by either building them on the farms and keep, keep lowering uh, that capital cost and making it more efficient. And, and I have to make it more efficient to, uh, to on the operating costs because what, what we're looking at as far as the future. So right now, I have an investor that's wanting me to go bigger and try to capture a lot more farms, but we're looking at trying to say, hey, let's get away from California. What if, what if that 22 cents a gallon goes away? Say something happens to the market gets flooded because we have seen LCF credits go down in call in, in price because it's getting flooded or or that market does go away so it's kind of shaky but there's a free market out there there's a like your big companies want to has a sustainability group and they want to offset their carbon footprint and so there's a voluntary market out there that we could get a long-term contract for 20 years but it's going to be a lot lower number so to be able to do that lower number uh, and not have uh, these other uh, credits that are supported by the state of California, but the free market out there supports it. That's more of a capitalistic system instead of a government propped up system. And so as we go, yeah, we're trying to achieve that. And that's what we're looking at, trying, trying to be able to do. All right. Well, great. Thanks. That was the last of the questions and comments in the chat. And we are now a couple minutes past the top of the hour. <laughs> So I wanna thank everyone for their participation today and special thanks to our speakers, Chris and Terry, um, and my co-moderator and ASAB Director of Membership, Sarah Rodriguez, as well as several others that helped make this member hour a reality. Our next webinar with a focus on circular systems will be in two weeks on Thursday, May 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we will have Mike McMeekin from Engineering Change Lab discuss challenges of the 21st century and engineering leadership. Um, all of these sessions in the series will be available on YouTube via the ASABE CBS website. Um, if you are uh, further interested in connecting with others and growing circular bioeconomy systems movement, we hope that you will join us at the CBS Day event in Omaha on July 9th. Um, and you can see ASABE's meeting registration page for more details on that. So again, thank you for your time and participation today, and we look forward to hosting you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.